Um, now I'm really pleased to welcome to the stage uh, John Haber. He's part of uh, Giant Spoon. Um, I also want to call them Big Spoon, Giant, Giant Spoon. It's definitely a very large spoon, whatever word we use. Uh, John's going to take us through uh, his perspective on um, products and branding, and uh, please welcome him to the stage. Thanks, John. Good luck. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I brought a water so I don't get a Marco Rubio situation up here. Um, Jessica, by the way, those, I think that drone's big enough you have to register it with the government, so make sure you do that. Um, so I'm John. I'm from Giant Spoon. We're a marketing strategy, communications planning, and innovation agency, and I think uh, it's been fun for me to be here to hear a lot of the conversations about media and creative and where they intersect and where they divide. Uh, our company is really built on the idea of ideas across all platforms and channels that are creative and, and, and how we can use those platforms to do more than just content, but to create experiences for consumers. So that's a lot of what this presentation is about, is uh, that uh, is how marketing can kind of evolve to be, to be actually products. Uh, and products can actually be content. So redefining what we think of as creative and as content. Uh, and, and we're going to talk a little bit about that today. But first, how we got to a point where we needed to think of things like products as content in order for consumers to see our, to see our work. So a little video about the history of how we got here. For years, mankind has tried to rid the world of ads. For our ancestors, ads couldn't be avoided, but everyone knew what was an ad and what wasn't. After many years, mankind invented cable, a way to pay for television so there would be no ads. But somehow, the ads still found a way. And so mankind invented TiVo, a way to skip past commercials. Finally, it appeared to be the end of ads. And everywhere, people rejoiced. The ads were stopped. Or so it seemed. With the rise of the internet, suddenly the ads had an entirely new way to attack us. Pop-ups. The top scientific minds were brought together to find a way to stop the ads once and for all. They invented the ad blocker. Suddenly there were no ads on phones, on computers, and everywhere. People rejoiced. But the ads adapted. They became smarter. They disguised themselves as news. All around the world people read news stories completely unaware they were reading ads. And now, the ads have taken the next step in their evolution. They have taken human form. Ads are among us. They could be your friend, your gardener. The ads are trying to wipe us out. The question is, how? Um, so, that, that raises some questions of, uh, you know, our, uh, how are we going to make ads human and how are we going to wipe everyone out? Um, no, so uh, I, I think that there <laughs> that's not the point. Um, uh, I think that we've done, I mean, that was a sort of a critique of native advertising, and, and, uh, but there are some good things about it, because we've had to now stop being advertisers and start being content creators and start creating things that are interesting editorially. This is an ex one of the great examples of that, where Netflix, uh, for Orange is the New Black, actually worked with the New York Times and the New York Times content production group, T-Brand Studios, to create a piece of content that has nothing to do with the show, that has nothing to do with Netflix, but that was thematically aligned with what the show is about. And that was this true piece of journalism that was about women's prisons that created a conversation that was indirectly aligned to the show. And we saw a lot of that with, with uh, Andy's presentation on GE, that they weren't pushing the brand hardcore in the content they were creating. So there are ways for us to, have, to, to build content that integrates into people's lives uh, and that they want to pull down. This is a bad example. So uh, The Atlantic um, uh, took a paid native post from Scientology. Now, granted, it's hard to advertise a religion, but still, this is not about just a topic that's interesting editorial in general. This is an article that probably shouldn't be in The Atlantic. It's a bad platform for it. Uh, and it's just about Scientology propaganda. And I think that's what the South Park guys were really uh, fearful of, is companies that are going to disguise propaganda and messages as advertising, as opposed to what Netflix did, was create some interesting content that aligned with something indirectly that they wanted to talk about. Which also leads to how influencers are doing it uh, good and bad. Uh, this campaign, I think, worked really well for the EOS lip gloss, but you know, ultimately this was just celebrities, influencers, uh, using it in their posts without any sort of recognition that it's an ad. Uh, and that's kind of what led us to a place where this stuff 
we have to self-regulate how we do this because the, our product has to be part of the story in an interesting way, not just sort of, we don't just sneak it in. Uh, I don't think that's where it works well. Uh, and that's led to some of these, uh, the, where the lines have blurred in a negative way. And this is where the government is actually stepping in and legislating. Uh, and I think there's a presentation today about sort of the legal, legal matters that are arising, especially with influencer marketing and what is an ad and what isn't an ad. Um, but it really is incumbent upon us to think about how we're approaching this. But that said, uh, we think the, there's a next evolution of this. Go to the next slide. Oops. Um, so, so what's next? So we talked about native content. We talked about content as marketers. We talked about brands being content companies. More and more brands are starting to do it. The Red Bulls of the world, Pepsi. Uh, and but what? Another iteration of this is actually creating products as marketing and content themselves. Um, so w I'm going to take you through some examples of this. But first, what's the point of creating a product that's separate from the main product you're selling? to be part of your brand's content strategy. Um, and it's another point to tell your story. It's another touch point. Um, it's an opportunity to break through with unique and unexpected partners. Buzz and PR is a big part of this. Um, and, uh, and getting fans or customers to actually willingly pull your content into their lives. And in fact, in many cases, some of the stuff brands are creating, uh, like you saw with the GE Moon Boots uh, in Andy's presentation, they're paying $300, $1,000, $5,000 for this product. Uh, so they're actually paying for our advertising if we do this well. Um, and why is sort of this thing on the other side here, this was actually created by a junior planner uh, at our agency on, for her personal blog. Um, and it's kind of just exemplifies how a story comes to life through many different touch points and content forms. And the brand, uh, the products are part of that story. It's a touch point of a brand story. So what you see here in the center is she read an article in The Atlantic. There's a good thing about The Atlantic. Um, called Old People Are Cool. And this was about how people of an older generation are really uh, doing amazing things in art and fashion and culture, which led her into this sort of rabbit hole of content in all these different forms that express the same idea in this same story from the Netflix documentary Iris about this amazing sharp-witted woman who, uh, who uh, is a, a, a fashion designer well into her 80s and 90s to the woman in the bottom here who uh, is 87 years old and into raver culture and her Instagram account is all about rave clothes and it's really amazing to subreddits called Ask an Old Person to BuzzFeed articles about 27 senior tattoos. And so like, it leads you into this content ecosystem, but it all ladders up to this same theme, old people are cool. And that's sort of the parallel to the brand story that you're trying to tell. How's it going to come to life in all these different channels and platforms? So uh, products as advertising, is it sneaky, smart, or both? It's both. Um, we have to find creative ways to, to, to break through. So here are some examples of some people who are doing it well. Um, this first section of examples are things that are simple, obvious, connection to the brand, and ultimately tell a piece of the brand story. Next slide. <laughs> uh, so here's one for when the, the Superman reboot, Man of Steel, uh, where uh, the, probably the most iconic piece of fashion from the movie besides the cape, which you, you know, you're really going to make a cape for people, but uh, was... Clark Kent's glasses and Lois Lane's glasses. So these were Clark Kent and Lois Lane branded Warby Parker glasses. And there were big, huge partnerships with this movie for Gillette razors and all kinds of things. But this one really stood out because it was organic. These things sold out in the, the fastest in history of any Warby Parker, Parker glasses. And the Warby Parker story that was told around this was about their cause, their mission to do good in the world. And they tied that through content and experiences and interactive uh, pieces uh, to the mythology of Superman. So it was a part of the story. Um, next slide. I don't know if this clicker is working. Um, here's one that's maybe not as exciting that you wouldn't expect much from, the Norton antivirus uh, software people. They actually worked with um, beta brand genes to create unhackable genes. So there was a metallic lining in the pockets that would prevent thieves from being able to scan and steal th your RFI through RFID tags information from your credit cards or phone. Now, this is laddering up to Norton's uh, security and innovation story that they wanted to tell. Um, and then there's stuff that we've all seen and are completely aware of, but uh, is it a product? Is it marketing? Um, it's not clear. So this is the first iteration of the Nike. Oh, sorry. 
new clicker. It's the first iteration of the, of the Nike sort of app ecosystem with the running apps and all the things that support. This is kind of gets into loyalty programs. This gets into with Under Armour and their digital ecosystem of products, the actual revenue stream for the brand. But at the same time, products can be digital products as well, as long as we're pro providing information, entertainment, utility. Um, so unexpected and cool AF, uh, the millennial who wrote this didn't tell me what AF means, so I'll skip it. Um, <laughs> um, so this one's really cool. I want one of these. The Adidas uh, and Virgin Galactic partnership. So Adidas actually used their engineers and their advanced design uh, part of their company to build a functional spacesuit for all the employees and staff working on the Virgin Galactic space program. It'll also be given to some of those people who are shelling out a quarter million dollars to be the first uh, commercial space travelers. But uh, for Virgin, it shows the modernization and the accessibility of space travel. That's that brand story. For Adidas, it shows their design capabilities, their performance story that they're trying to tell, that they can actually put Nomex fire-resistant threading into a spacesuit and create shock-absorbent boots. And uh, So there's two brand stories that these are telling, and there's all kinds of documentary and interesting content that can be built around this product collaboration. Uh, this is another one from our friends at GE. They have advanced materials that are able to function in the highest heats on Earth, including in jet engines and turbines and actual spacesuits. Um, and they, and again, it's just like we saw with Andy's presentation, they have to tell this complicated science story about these advanced materials. So instead of just talking about a jet engine, they said, you know what, let's use our scientists and actually create a hot sauce packaging that can withstand the highest heats known to man. So it's the most advanced hot sauce packaging in the world. Then partnered with a media company, Thrillist, to find the hottest peppers and make the hottest hot sauce. Um, and then that's how they're using that Thrillist media platform to make their story of the innovation of their brand and their materials and their inventiveness come to life through something much more tangible than jet engines, which is hot sauce packaging. Um, here's a section of just, I see what you did there. Um, so Oscar Mayer, they're selling meat, they're selling bacon. Uh, and so, you know, the brand story there has to be about craving, about desire, about a reason to get up in the morning. So the product idea ties right from that. It's a branded alarm on the, on, that you can download as an app with a add-on extension product that actually when it, the alarm goes off, it emits the smell of bacon uh, to wake you up. So how many people got these? It doesn't matter. You know, <laughs> but it's cool and people are sharing it and people are now talking about Oscar Mayer and connecting it to that sort of craving moment of, of bacon. Um, this is another one. So Netflix uh, uh, has sort of inherently owned binging as a behavior. They, they seem like they invented it, but there are a lot of people coming after them in the streaming business. Even mainstream media companies are now making their content available uh, in bingeable form. So in this case, Netflix wants to continue to own the idea of binging. So they have these, they design these socks. Because, you know, binging is like you wrap up in a blanket, you're in your sweats, you put your socks on, you're going to binge a show, and it's that cozy, comfortable thing. So they released this idea of socks with an accelerometer in it where if you fall asleep, the socks will pause the Netflix show that you're watching automatically. And what they did that was just really smart was they just said, like, we're not going to go, you know, source, you know, some sweatshop somewhere to make these socks. We're just going to release the design of how the accelerometer works and what the software is and to let people, let the maker community make this product on their own, which is something that was a really interesting way to, to, to do something innovative and not actually stretch into product development themselves. Um, and then, you know, I think this is the last one. Um, and I have a minute 40 left, so I think I actually did this on time. Uh, Pizza Hut in Hong Kong. Uh, what's the story of pizza besides its cheese and bread and sauce? But the story is around people coming together, a congregation, the family coming together and watching shows, watching, watching a movie together. It's that sort of really communal, you know, emotional experience that they can elevate the idea of pizza, elevate the brand story of pizza. Um, so what they did was, in the boxes, they actually included a lens that you could cut a hole in the box and put the lens there, and then they developed an app with content on it where you could put your phone behind that lens, and it would actually project the content onto a wall. Again, how many people put their phone in the greasy pizza box and projected? It doesn't matter. It still is a way that they're using product as content to tell part of that brand story. Uh, and then there's a lot of things you can do around this with social and experiences and other content that you create about the making of or the design of this uh, that gives you a reason to enter people's lives. 
So ultimately, uh, this is kind of the, the takeaways from it. Um, you know, are you solving a need? Are you doing something funny, something interesting? Uh, a friend of mine always posts on my social posts, uh, hashtag N-I-O-F, not interesting or funny. And I feel like that's a good filter for, for us with everything that we do. Is it interesting, meaning useful, entertaining, you know, or is it funny? Is it something that is, brings value to people's lives? Uh, so that, that being said, no tchotchkes. We're not talking about the little thing that you, products, is that little light that you squeeze and the light goes on for your keys. Like that's not, that's not products as advertising. Um, so that, that's sort of the big filter there. Um, if you don't want to produce, manufacture something on your own, find the right collaborative partner who can actually do the manufacturing. Or ask your agency. I'm sure the agency would love to try and figure this out. I know we would, because uh, uh, it is something different. And there is also traditional brand content that can be created around this as a centerpiece. Um, and does it align with your brand story? And for me, that's the biggest takeaway is, you know, there's so many things that are part of our story as brands now that we can't think of creative as content, as video and images. Creative is everything that touches a person's life. Everything is media, and everything's an opportunity to connect. And I think products is just one example of that, of how it's expanded beyond what it used to be. Um, and uh, I think that's it. Thank you. Uh, and that's our Twitter account. <laughs> Thank you. I ended right on time. This is the correct one. Thanks so much for staying on time. That was, uh, that was awesome AF. I don't know what AF means. I'm going to use that all the time. Anyone know? No, no. All right. Um, uh, great, great stuff. Really interesting start to the day.